In your case, it may not work out good in your end. The tragedy is a good thing. You want to know something? Tragedy is not a good thing. Amen. There's nothing good about a tragedy. There's nothing good about a heart attack. There's nothing good about death. There's nothing good about a shooting. There's nothing good about getting prostate cancer. There's nothing good about getting brain cancer. Tragedy is not good. So don't tell someone, it's good that you got cancer. That's not what the Scripture is teaching. These words are not only hollow, they are hurtful to someone who is already hurting. Number three, it is misunderstood. My goal today is to help each of us fully understand in the next series of lessons what God is saying to us so that we can stop staring and start singing again. I want us to look at God's promises, His purpose, and finally the process He takes us through for us to arrive at that. Here's the entire sermon in one sentence, and we can go home. God's good for us is not our comfortability, but our conformity to Christ. God is not interested in you getting comfortable as much as He is to conform you to His image. Whatever it takes for me to become more like Christ, that's what I want to be. I hear too many stories of too many preachers who say, I rebelled against God. I refused to believe God. I refused to preach the gospel until God did something to me that caused me to do it. I used to say, God, keep me preaching. I don't lose any of my children to get my attention. I don't have to go through some tragedy in life that I've been so rebellious that God has got to get my attention and He's got to cause something to happen in my life and I'll say, oh God, oh God. That's the reason I don't like to visit people in the hospital and try to win them to Christ. I don't go to jails trying to win anybody to Christ. It happens, but I don't because I've had more people to want to be saved when they're sick or in jail and when they get out or get well, they never come to church. We need to take caution as we read this verse and not read into this verse what is not there. Number one, Paul does not say that everyone will be blessed. Or all things for people will work out. Some things are not going to work out in your life. Not to some people. Number two, when a person says, I am so very blessed... They usually are looking at this perspective from the materialistic side. People say on Facebook, I have been so blessed. They got a boyfriend. They got a girlfriend. They got a job. They got a car. They got some new clothes. They got a new home. They just, earned, they just won the lottery. That's not what God's talking about here. You've been blessed doesn't mean there are people that are blessed that never have anything but an old shack to live in or no car to run down, or have no money. Blessing does not mean materialistic things. They are referring that God's blessed them when in fact that is a false position to take. Number three, Paul is talking only about believers in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords. If you're not a believer... If you've not been born again, this verse is not talking to you. Number four, Paul is not saying all things work together for good. Isn't that marvelous how everything seems to be conspiring together for your well-being? He's not saying that. Isn't it great that you're going through so much suffering because God is trying to straighten you out? You don't normally say that to a person going through some difficulties. You don't go up to a person and say, Man, you must be a real bad, you must be really on God's bad side because He's sure taking you through some trials. You don't, I've learned not to say that. I mean, all these mistakes I've done in my ministry, now I apologize for saying all those things because I misunderstood what Romans 8 28 says. Right. Number five, the major difference between false optimism of the world 
and the generalities in which worldly people delight and this particular statement of Scripture. We want to be optimistic. You know, my good friend on television, Joel Osteen and Robert Schuller, they present such a positive message. They smile and say everything's going to be all right. Folks, everything's not going to always be all right. Amen. There are going to be some tragedies in our lives. We're going to be some, there's going to be some things in our lives. They have like, everything's going to work out in the end. It's a false optimism. Everything don't work out like you want them to work out. You're not going to get the job that you want. You're not going to get the husband you want. You're not going to get the wife you want. You're not going to get the children you prayed for. You're not going to get the job you want. There are some things that just don't work out according to the way you want them to work out. The optimism you have, I wanted to pastor a church of a thousand. That was my goal in life. I wanted to pastor a church of a thousand. Here I am. Have I been blessed? Richly blessed. It's not in numbers and books. That's why the believer's salvation ever becomes necessary. All is not right with the world. All is wrong with the world. There is the necessary why I have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because the world is wrong in their belief, in their optimism. They think everything in men is going to work out. Most people believe that maybe this is all there is to life and that's it. Some people believe they'll come back as an ant. There are some people that believe that they, that, that, that they will all eventually get to go to some kind of heaven. They're optimistic about the future. They are wrong. The optimism that so many have is false optimism. You know if a person is falsely allured into a false kind of optimism about life which is going to damn their soul, that is not good. If a person goes to bed with a false kind of optimism that does not stand up to the test of truth and the facts of life, that is not good. When you lay your head down at night and you have an optimism that everything's all right with you and you're lost, that's not good. Sometimes you need to be, you need to be understood all is not right in your life if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. So we must examine closely this statement since Paul is so often misquoted. Let me give you four brief illustrations before we get into the exposition of the text next time. God's good for us is not our comfortability, but our conformity to Christ. God weaves His ways for His glory and for our good. I have prayed. I don't want God to be involved in my life. Now I know some of you don't pray that. Maybe. I want God to be involved in my life when I walk down out of this pulpit. When I leave this pulpit, this church, get in my car, I want God to be right there. When I go home and nobody else is there, I want God to be right next to me. I want Him to be involved in my mind, my life, what I watch, what I do, what I say. I never ask God, God, would you mind stepping outside? Would you mind stepping outside? And here's some things I know you're going to be embarrassed about. When I walk into places and they know I'm a preacher, my kids will cut off the TV. My kids say, Dad, you don't need to be watching this. Wait a minute. What do you mean? I say, what are you doing? Yeah. I want God to be involved in my life 24-7. I really do. I don't want God just to show up when I get in trouble. I want God to be there controlling my life in the sense that I'm going to be willing to be obedient to Him. 
Well, God weaves his way through his, uh, for his glory. Let me illustrate. Joseph. Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. You remember that. Falsely accused, mistreated by, uh, by Potter, and suffered greatly. He never asked for any of that. He never saw anything coming. And finally, when he met his brothers, and I've been reading Genesis 13 days, and I'm in Deuteronomy. Oh, I can't wait to get to Joshua. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God had a plan for Joseph, but he didn't take the path that Joseph would like to have taken. Number two, Jonah. Jonah's a negative illustration. He came to expect good from God, which in his definition was pleasure and comfort. When you don't get everything you want, you blame God for it. When everything goes bad, you blame God for it. You've got to be careful about blaspheming the name of God by saying God's not doing you any good. Where is God? That's blasphemous. You're putting a character on God that's not... God is never going to do anything in your life that's bad. Think bad things are going to happen in your life. But God's going to take that bad and can turn it into good, per se. God was good to Jonah by using pagan sailors, a big fish, a plant, and even a worm to accomplish his ultimate purpose of saving Ninevites and teaching Jonah a lesson. Jonah was mad because God was going to do good to Ninevites and he didn't think the Ninevites should be saved because they were so bad and God said, I'm going to save them anyway. Job. Job was a righteous man with, who experienced incredible suffering. And the teaching of this book is that every event in our lives cannot be viewed be reviewed as a result of some act on our part. Some things are going to happen in your life that you had no choice in it happening to your life. Job's friend tried to link suffering with sin and prosperity with piety. And, and Job learned that there is a plan and a purpose, but the particulars may not may be unexplainable into your life. I can't explain everything that happens in my life. I, I, I can't even figure it out, good or bad. But here's what I believe God is working in my life to make me to become what I want to be, even when I sin. God doesn't call sin in my life, but even when I get in a bad place, God is bringing for my purpose. Then there's Jesus. Perhaps the greatest illustration in Romans 8.28 is found in the life of Jesus himself. Many awful things was done to him. He was denied, betrayed, falsely accused, wrongly tried, found guilty, beaten, spit upon, mocked, and finally crucified. There. But God brought incredible good out of his acts that were against him. Can you imagine out of all the acts of Jesus Christ that happened to him became our salvation? Acts 2.23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's self set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. I want you to notice something. God uses wicked men to nail him to the cross, but it was God in his sovereignty and man's responsibility Humans did something horrible, but God used what they did to carry out His plan of salvation. Amen. Man was responsible for putting Christ on the cross, but, Christ, but God was responsible when He went to the cross, provides the means whereby we can be saved. And if we, can we be saved? By the bad things that happened to Jesus, we, we can know salvation in Christ Jesus. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful and thankful that as we learn the Scriptures, we learn 
just exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. Father, we thank you that we all go through tragedy in life. We all need encouragement in different times. We are often blessed in many, many ways. Whether it's tragedy or prosperity, you're there. You're there in our lives. When we're obedient or disobedient, if we are a believer, if we have truly been born again, you are committed to finish what you've started. And we thank you for that security. Even when we fail, you pick us up. You never give up on us. You're going to move us into your image from one level to another level to another level. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for that. May we give you praise. And we thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Johnny? Thank you.